It is not a personal conviction. It is a every Christian conviction. If you claim that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but you are in these organizations, you will not go to heaven if you die in it. The scripture says that it says that four times in the New Testament is any org worth you going to hell for eternity. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Purposely Crest. Here where we talk about all things life with Jesus at the center of it. So today is going to be part three of our book series of Evil Altars, Deliverance from the Spirit of Fraternity. And my co-host here, India Martin. We're here to move on to the next organization, which is going to be Alpha Kappa Alpha. So just a fair warning, this is going to be a long video so you can either watch half of it today the other half tomorrow or you can watch it all in one take maybe clean or something while you're listening to it or whatever but um just getting you prepared so without further ado let's get started so before we get started india you want to pray us in absolutely all right um first and foremost um Glory to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have blessed us to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Lord, we thank you that you are calling on your children, Lord, because you just love us so much that you are willing to continue to, uh, you know, pull on us, Lord, and then to select children, Lord, that will cry out and, and warn others. So, Father God, we thank you that there, during this time, your Holy Spirit is being poured out upon us and, and many. We thank you that the spirit of truth is catching on like a wildfire throughout this nation. Lord, we thank you for your word in the Holy Bible. We thank you, Father God, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Lord God. And we thank you for an opportunity to spread your truth um, using this platform as a ministry uh, my prayer is that, Lord, those who are wondering about idolatry and Greek letter organizations, those who needed that extra push, those who were looking for confirmation, may they hear us from our hearts. May they hear the voice of God. May they understand that we are not here to ridicule. We are not here to bash, but we are here to spread the gospel. So, Father God, I pray that this word reaches the masses. I pray that it shakes and rattles all the foundations of anyone who has been rooted in idolatry. And may it be received with love. May it be received with understanding. And may more of your children come out of idolatry, come out of deception. May the veil be lifted. Hallelujah. And God, may you get the glory in everything that we do, Father God. And may you take over this meeting right now, Father God. Please decrease us, Lord. Make it as le less of us as possible, Father God, and all about you. So, Father God, I give you reign, rule, and dominion over Cress and I as we share your word that you have commanded us to share. And in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so before we get into um, today's topic, we're going to have a brief like overview of what we talked about on the first and the second episode of this series. The um, if you watch the first two episodes, if you haven't, um, I'll link it in the description below. It I highly encourage you to watch it. The first episode was basically us teaching on according to the book because we went according to this book. Um, we went uh, on what idolatry is, what worship is, harlotry. We described it with definitions. Um, we also explained in our first video, I gave you like a brief introduction on the author of the book, which is Pastor Al Barlow, and um, how he gave a, a, test, a testimony of how he was indoctrinated into three different organizations. He was uh, in Junior Striners when he was a child. He was uh, invited into the boule and he was an alpha. Um, but to further go along with that, he talked about how they would kneel and eat foods prepared to the God of alpha. On page 127, he talked about how the candidates would drink to the health of alpha. 
um, and that the candidates would kneel. And then further down, it says bending over a table or some other object, the candidate received the three impressions, which he was paddled um, as the candidate repeats alpha each time. Alpha also calls themselves the light, which we all know that Jesus is the light, not alpha. We know that according to John 8, 12. So based on what we covered in part one, the initiation process of alpha was indeed worship and sacrificing of your soul to God's with an S because it actually has that in the ritual. And the Sphinx is their God, which is ultimately Satan. Um, in the first episode, I gave you three scriptures. Ooh. And God... <laughs> I'm gonna give a little snippet of my dream that I had. God actually, I had a dream two nights ago. And in that dream, there was a, a bleachers full of people and they were all Greek. And I was sitting here teaching to them and the Lord placed it on my heart to read these three scriptures um, again, which I actually read in uh, the first episode. And then he gave me something else to say, but I'm gonna leave that to the end of this video to say that. So the three scriptures that he gave me to say were 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. So in KJV, it says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The next scripture was Galatians 5, 19 through 21 that says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lavishness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then the last scripture was Revelation 21, 8. But the fear, fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So that's what I talked about in the first episode. And that's what the Lord wanted me to remind the viewers, these three, these three scriptures again. <laughs> and I also, while studying, I actually came across a fourth scripture, which also said the same thing. Ephesians 5, 5 saying idolaters have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So that's New Testament. Those are all four in the New Testament. So I highly encourage you guys to stop looking at your favorite pastors. Stop looking at your favorite pastors who rarely teach you about sin, who talk about uh, talk only about prosperity. Stop looking at them so blindly. I know there are a lot of pastors. There's a lot of people in ministry in the fivefold ministry that are in Greek sororities and uh, Greek sororities and secret societies. Guys, you, got, you cannot look at them as your standard. You have to look at the Bible. You have to see what God is saying about idolatry. I know you guys have heard us countless, countless, countless of times saying it's idolatry, it's idolatry, it's idolatry. There are other gods. If you just took a look at your ritual and read your ritual, guys, I don't, I'm trying not to cry. If you just read your ritual with the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what we are talking about, he will show you. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting a little teary eyed because I have family, I have friends that are in these organizations. And I care deeply about them. But I'm going to do the work of the Lord, which is cry loud and spare not. And that's why me and Andy are here. 
Yeah. Um, please know that we truly do love y'all. Like this comes from a place of love. Um, it's not a place of judgment because we've been there. Honestly, Chris, as you probably have seen, I've been tapping my eyes. I've been teary eyed since that prayer because this is so serious. Like this is literally the difference between life and death. And if you read the Bible and you really dig into it and you ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit, you'll learn that death begins with a spiritual death. And then as you continue to be pulled further and further away from God, that leads to a physical death. And what people don't understand is when you're bowing down to that altar, there's a transaction that's being made. You never go to an altar without offering something and you always expect to get something in return. So when you're at the wrong altar, right? When you're at an altar for Satan, whether you know it or not, a transaction has taken place, a spiritual transaction. So when you are at a church altar, you are praising and worshiping God. Usually you're offering up your praise. Um, you're repenting. You may renounce something, um, not just a Greek letter organization. Maybe it's a, a lifestyle or some of the uh, sins that Chris has mentioned in scripture. And there's an expectation that you get something in return, right? You expect the Holy Spirit, the fire of the living God to dwell within you. And the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and breathe life into you. That's why usually, you know, you if you continue to dig in the word, you continue to consecrate yourself and you go through this process of sanctification, like many of us are going through, stuff is going to continue to shed off of you. Your spiritual eyes will be opened and you will see this for what it is. But you first have to fully surrender to God and you have to sincerely ask him. And I will tell you all from personal experience, the hardest thing to cast down is pride. Mm -hmm. So the main thing that we hear from people is, oh, I know God. I, I, I'm not worshiping no God. How do you know? Many of you have not even opened your ritual books outside of a chapter meeting, outside of a regional meeting. And at that time, you are simply opening it, opening it, and you're reciting something over and over again. You're not even thinking about it. And that's the whole intent. It's just for you to read and say things. But the word says we will be held accountable for every single word that we say. All right. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. And if we can say the power of life and death lies within the tongue for stuff on one end of the spectrum. So we always say, you know, I'm going to claim that I'll be prosperous. You know, that's what Chris was talking about, that prosperity gospel, that doctrine of grace. Well, guess what? Doctrine of grace is full of lies because what it tells you that you can do is you can live your life the way you want to. You don't ever have to follow God's precepts, his rules, his statutes. You don't have to do anything. You can just say, I believe in Jesus Christ and expect to go to heaven. And that's not how it works. Because once you follow Christ and you say you believe in him, that means you have to abide in him. That means you follow his ways. Look up what it means in a biblical concordance for following Christ. And you'll see what we're talking about. So I won't go too deeper. <laughs> I'll stop there, Chris, not trying to, you know, keep no, us going. Fine. I need a moment. <laughs> this is from a place of love. Um, and we, you know, Christ loved us first. So therefore we love him. He showed us what love is. And truth comes from love. If you think about it this way, in closing for this part. How do you feel about friends who never tell you the truth? Have there, has there ever been a time in your life where you have been on the brink of disaster based on making a bad decision? Or maybe a friend saw you struggling in whatever area of your life. What if they never told you? What if they never set you down and said, hey, friend, we need to talk. I'm concerned. Here's what I know. Here's what I'm seeing from you. And here's what the word of God says. Come pray with me. Let's talk about it. Let's fast about it. If you're struggling with this, go to God, pray fast. So I'm not telling you to go to a friend who's in this organization um, to have that conversation if you're not sure where you stand yourself. But what I'm saying is go to God about it, pray and fast or seek wise, godly counsel. 
someone who is not affiliated with this. Otherwise, it is the blind leading the blind. So we love y'all and we hope this information truly blesses you, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be a big pill to swallow, especially yeah. during this time. Let's be real. You know, people are stirring politics into all of this. But at the end of the day, it's not about who's president, even if they could be a member of a Greek letter organization. It's about us obeying God. Yeah. And there's a scripture I wanted to follow up with when I was talking about your favorite pastors. Um, you know, I've I've heard, you know, some some pastors say along the lines of I've done this, I do this, I do this for the community, I do this. That's great but that's not going to get you into heaven. Mm -hmm. Your works won't get you into heaven. And there's scripture for that. So it says in Matthew 7, 22, 24, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wondrous works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Those are not unbelievers, y'all. That's not unbelievers that they're talking about. Those are people who are doing the work for the Lord. So we can go ahead and move on to the next thing, but I just really wanted to touch on that um, as far as like with your, your ministers, your pastors, um, people in the five-fold ministry that are part of Greek organizations that you guys were listening to that don't give you scripture either, by the way. <laughs> Um, okay. I just want to touch on that real fast. When they do in their podcast and they their their YouTube videos and they can't give you scripture, only thing they can give you is their opinion and what they think and what is not, but they won't read their ritual that we are reading that's Googleable, by the way. And they won't pull up any scriptures. That's automatic. That should automatically be a red flag to you. Because we come loaded with scripture. And the rituals and compare it for you, but you still got to do your own work and you got to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you're. So. Second video, I think I talked about that briefly. Um, I said Pastor Al came and he came and gave his full testimony. You know, he left. Some uh, he gave us some extra parts than what we saw in the book. Um, he touched on the once saved, always saved doctrine in the book, not being a thing. <laughs> being the, I think he said doctrines of devils, I think is what he said. Mm -hmm. uh, once saved, always saved. Um, highly, highly recommend y'all go watch that as well. I'll link all of that in the description below. Um, so as we move on to the next organization, which is AKA, um, before, well, actually, before I move on, Pastor Al spoke about um, inactivity, and I think that's really important because in my video, I talked about my my uh, my testimony video. I talked about how I was inactive and I was very very not involved in Delta whatsoever. And so, when all of this was brought to my attention, that was one of the excuses I had. Like, I'm not active. Like, I don't do anything with the org whatsoever. And um, yeah, he actually touched on that on page 88 of his book. <laughs> and he said, uh, in activity or lack of pain dues is not repentance. So if the Lord has spoken to you and you know for a fact that the Lord has spoken to you about getting renouncing this organization and your excuse is I'm inactive. I don't do anything with the org. This is for you. It's not repentance. Repentance involves turning away from a sin, which means you cannot stay in the organization and that be repentance. You actually have to turn away from the organization, which involves renouncing. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to touch on that. Um, and then, um, and the reason why, why do you have to renounce? Because you made a covenant. When we join the organization, and we went through the whole initiation ceremony. That was a covenant being made, which we talked about in the first video and touched on in the second video as well. So covenants do not break unless you break them. And you can see an example of that in Joshua 9, 
um, the Gibeonites tricked the Israelites to make a league with them, which was a covenant. And in agreement, they said that they would not harm them. The backstory, the Gibeonites, God told Joshua and the Israelites to destroy everybody. <laughs> and the Gibeonites disguised themselves and went over to Joshua and tricked themselves, I mean, and tricked Joshua to make them think that they were foreigners from a distant land and not the people they were actually supposed to kill. And so they were able to make a covenant. Joshua did not go to God and ask God, can, can I make this covenant with him? Can I make this lead with him? And so when Joshua found out that they tricked him, they wanted to kill the Gibeonites, but they couldn't because the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites were like, no, 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 you made that lead with us. And God honored that, even though it went against what he told them to do. God honored that. And you can see that um, in 2 Samuel 21, in that agreement, hundreds of years later, <laughs> there was a famine for three years during the reign of King David. And in 2 Samuel 21, the Lord revealed to David that the famine was because Saul had killed some Gibeonites. So David had to go make an atonement for that. So that covenant was still intact. So it doesn't matter how many years you have been in these organizations, even if you're inactive, that covenant is still intact and it's going to follow you to death unless you renounce it and repent. So... And why is that? We touched on that in the first video. I believe the first and maybe the second video we talked about. It's like you're marrying that God because an altar is where people come and they get married. Um, we even wear white like. <laughs> um, so like. Yeah, you pledge your life to it and you mm -hmm. actually say that out of your mouth. So. Like I said, only way to come out of that is repent and renounce it. Um. Yeah, now, now I think we can go into it. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk about mixture. Mm, do you want to touch on the mixture part? And then talk yeah. about it. Sure. Um, and I also wanted to go back uh, just to, I guess I want to explain a little more about what Chris means by like when she says renounce, because keep in mind, and as she said, we, we talked about this before, but Renouncing is different from denouncing. So renouncing is personal between you and God. It is breaking that covenant, right? So spiritually, you are free. You are no longer in covenant with this demon who is uh, masquerading as a Greek god or a Greek goddess for this organization. Um, but I also want you to know that does not mean you have to denounce immediately, do we recommend you do it? Absolutely, because the word of God says to expose darkness. And I will tell you that most of the time, folks who have renounced end up denouncing because they grow uncomfortable and they feel like there's still some some adultery against God going on because people are still connecting them to that organization, even though they know the truth. So typically the Holy Spirit will move on you <laughs> and you'll you'll end up denouncing. But I also want to make sure you are aware that if you're not ready, that's OK. But renouncing, I believe, is the first step to break that spiritual covenant that Chris was sharing with you. Um, so maybe it'll come in your own time, but at least taking this step will give you freedom. Now, about mixture, we bring up mixture because, uh, you know, as Christians, we are only to praise and worship and honor and have this reverence for God. So let's think about mixture, because as Christians, as blood bought believers, we are not to mix with darkness. All right. And so when you think about it, you know, we've seen in the word where it says, what hath light with darkness? How can two walk unless they agree? Unequally yoked, a little leaven will spoil the pot. Another way to look at this is that if the organization has evil roots, right, rooted in idolatry, rooted in Freemasonry, rooted in demonic doctrine, then what type of fruit is it going to produce? It's going to be rotten fruit. It's going to be defiled fruit. And guess what? You are that fruit. OK, so you can't go backwards. You can't say I'm going to 
stop singing the prayers. Um, I'm singing the hymns. I'm going to stop saying the prayers. I'm going to stop attending chapter meetings. I'm no longer going to go to probates. Like, even if you stop all of that, that covenant has still been established. Those words are still in your heart. They're still in your mind. If you're still wearing the paraphernalia, guess what? That shield is still in your chest. So none of that matters. And keep in mind, again, our goal is to be pleasing to God. Exodus 23 through 5 says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Let's pause right there. That scripture really, really hit me hard because I have children. And so I thought to myself, by me disobeying God, that iniquity is going to fall upon my children and third and fourth generations. So what you don't understand is your sin gets passed down. That opens the door for generational curses. And notice that it says unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So God is telling us that if we are disobeying him, if we're being rebellious and we're bowing down to these gods and we're making these graven images and we're wearing their likeness and these images on our chest and the letters on our vehicles and even on the children before they even know what it is. You're telling God that you hate him. That's how deep it is. It really is absolutely that deep. All right. And um, it says continued, you know, yes, be yes. And no, be a no. All right. So with every idle word, you're going to be held accountable for it. Doesn't matter if you thought it was unimportant. Doesn't matter that you said, oh, it's just a chant. In the eyes of God, it matters. And that leads to Proverbs 18, 21. You know, this is a, a common scripture. We've said it for years, but we all often compartmentalize it or we only apply it to what we want to apply it to. And Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So notice I just talked about evil roots, the fruit that's grown, Right. You're a product of those roots, but then you're eating the fruit as well. So with that being said, um, we also want to jump into another part of mixture, which is the Greek mythology aspect of it, um, because Atlas is the Greek god on the shield for Alpha Kappa Alpha. And if you're like most people, you said to yourself, it's just a mascot, you know, it's no big deal. Um, but I want you to think about the pedestal that these organizations set their founders upon. They always talk about how they are highly intelligent women and men, if it's a fraternity. They always talk about they were the top of their class. They were this, they were that, they were well-versed, they were incredibly educated. But yet I find it alarming that no one in these organizations made the connection that a Greek god did not align with the word of God, that a Greek God is what God tells us our one true God, what he tells us not to worship, not to bow down. Like, I get it. Google didn't exist back when all these organizations were founded. However, if they studied to put all this information together, how was this amiss? And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because Atlas, he was known as a Titan or a pre-Olympian God is um, what he was considered or is considered. And he was condemned by Zeus. So, you know, Zeus is another well-known Greek God. Um, and he was condemned by Zeus to hold up the heavens or the sky for eternity after losing a war. And so, first of all, we know that there's nothing, there's no Greek God. There's nothing that holds up the heavens or the sky except for God himself because he created it. So I'm going to give you a scripture for that in a moment. But I also want to talk about roots because I just mentioned that. So as I continue to read, I learned that Atlas is a descendant of Cronus. 
I believe that's how it's pronounced. And Cronus made it with his older sister, Rhea. So let's think about the conception. Like, let's think about that family bloodline. That's incest. So the foundation of his existence is perversion. Does that align with the word of God? No. Would you want a descendant of perversion where they tout this as something that is acceptable in Greek mythology? Would you be proud to continue to wear that on your chest? And so I know when I was in a you know organization similar to this, symbolism was important. It was everything, whether you were in the official process or if you were underground, symbolism meant something. So every symbol and phrase has a deeper meaning, whether you know it or not. And if I'm a Christian woman building an organization founded on Christian principles, I probably want a mascot that aligns with Christian values. I probably want a mascot that upholds the word of God. And nothing about these Greek gods aligns with the word of God, as you can see. All right. Um, if you study more about their roles, um, just different stories, how they were born, they were forever uh, betraying one another, stealing you know, from one another. Um, again, a lot of incest, just a lot of sin with all these mythological characters. Um, so why would they choose Atlas? I can't tell you. I don't have that answer. But again, I want you to really think about the roots. And I want you to also keep in mind that Greek mythology is just that. It is a myth. So nowhere in the Bible does it credit Atlas for holding up the heavens and the sky. And Job 26, 7 says, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. So I'm going to repeat that. He suspends the earth over nothing. God, the creator of heaven and earth not Atlas, okay? And another thing, Atlas was falsely, and I do mean that, falsely credited with the invention of the first celestial spear, and he's credited with strength and endurance. You can actually see a statue of him at the Rockefeller Center in New York, which we'll put in this video. And you'll notice that he's... Uh, I would say, placed in different areas throughout the United States to represent this strength and endurance. But again, we know our strength comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from a, a mythological creature, right, or an individual. Um, so think about that. Think about the roots again. Think about what Atlas represents. And as a Christian, God-fearing woman, do you still feel comfortable wearing this graven image on your chest? Do you feel comfortable having those letters on your vehicle or anywhere for that matter, any paraphernalia, do you feel comfortable wearing that? Because that means when you go into church with a keychain, with the jacket, wherever you are, you are waving that Greek God, Atlas, all in the Lord's face, trying to defile his space, even if you don't know it. It's disrespectful and it's an abomination to God. Yeah. Yeah. So um, now we're going to move into the induction ceremony for AKA. Um, we, we're going to start on page 121. I'm going to just basically read certain parts of their ritual that's in the book. And then um, Indy is going to come behind me and, 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 you know, talk to me about the symbolism and some of the definitions of the words. Um, you have to bear with me with some of these words. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. OK. Same. <laughs> and I, I, mean, forgot to go to Google. Okay. <laughs> I forgot to go to Google and type it in and say, how do you say this? <laughs> so bear with us. OK. So on page 121, um, the introduction into membership of the Ivy Leaf Pledge Club. Guys, remember, this is public knowledge. This is on Google. You can Google it. Everything that I'm reading is already public. So page 121, introduction into membership of the Ivy Leaf Pledge Club must involve this pledging ceremony. And this pledging ceremony is a part of the induction into full membership of AKA. 
So that means honorary members. That also means real, real or paper members. Everybody has to go through this entire process to be to be inducted into the full membership of AKA. And boy, y'all do a lot. So the dress for these induction ceremony is the sorority members wear white dresses and the candidates wear black dresses for the first degree. There's several degrees. And then they'll um, wear the candidates will wear white for the remaining two degrees. I, I believe it's two. It might be a little bit more than that. So the candidates assemble into the ant room where they are questioned by the centennial. On page 132, the candidates stand in a semicircle and the table, which is really is the altar, is facing the basilis, basilis. <laughs> and upon the table, which is an altar, are two candle holders with pink and green candles and a pledge book before a centerpiece of tea roses and or a pot of ivy. Mm, so yeah, nice little altar set up. Nice altar, huh? And then um, you want to explain to them what the centennial is before we go further? Yeah. yeah. Um, so a centennial, again, y'all, I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm butchering this. Is it centennial? It could Sentinel. be Sentinel. I'm sorry. Sentinel, maybe, but it's a soldier or guard whose job is to stand and keep watch. And according to Miriam Webster, they give you synonyms such as custodian, keeper, and warder. They actually had warder in all caps, which was alarming to me because when you think of a warder, you think of bondage, you think of prison, right? And here's something also interesting in the Bible. Um, a sentinel is considered a watcher angel who comes down from heaven with authority to speak for God. And to take it a step further, uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia actually describes watcher angels as servants of God who, and they quote, possess a certain authority to speak the decrees of God and from a heavenly council who listen to God's word and then act as divine messengers to bring these commands and revelations to human beings. So biblically, this is a very, very important job. And I also want you to keep in mind that for those who say it's not a, a religion or not a false religion, these organizations are riddled with religious terms. All right. So now we have the sentinel who is a messenger of God who, who should have authority to speak the decrees of God. So we know this organization doesn't have that authority. So then exactly what decrees are they speaking of? Well, we know, right? And we know the decrees are for their little G God, not for our big God. So um, I'll let you and continue, then, Chris. Yeah. And then the Basilius, Basilius, I think I'm saying that right. In the Greek concordance from the Blue Letter Bible app, it means a leader of the people, a prince, a commander, lord of the land and a king. So that's basically who is running the show in this um, induction ceremony and reading everything that um, the pilot, that candidates um repeat mm -hmm. so um yeah and if you go by the greek law a basilis is the chief religious officer who who presided over areopagus which is a aristocratic council for homicide murder so we talking homicide. about murder now <laughs> a religious homicide officer court. <laughs> and the Thesmothetai? I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't know either. Who were the determiners of customs. And um, as we review the uh, excerpts of that, I just want you guys to pay attention to the role of the Basilis. Just listen to what we're saying that they are telling everyone to say. They have to repeat. So if we go down to um, the AKA prayer, which starts on page 132, it starts with, I think that I shall, hold on, let me take that back. 
not I, I'm going to have to say you because I, because power of the tongue, like our words that's coming out of our mouth. I just want to be careful to make sure I don't say something that I got to go repent and renounce later. So um, I'm going to replace I with you as in AKs. So it starts with you that should never know another love that thrills me so dwells in your heart by night, by day, as does your love for AKA. So it's saying by day, by night, your love for AKA. So, you know, you're already, you're already, you're already mm -hmm. saying that that's your love. That's your love. And that's contrary and to the scriptures. Good. Say what now? I'm sorry. Look, I just jumped in, but it says dwells in your heart. So again, the Holy Spirit should yeah. dwell in your heart. The love of God should yeah. dwell in your heart. So it's like telling you that it's it's in you deep. Yeah. And if we look at scripture, Matthew 22, 37, 38 says, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. So if you have AKA dwelling in your heart, how are you going to love your Lord, your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind? That's a conflict of interest. You can't do both. So. And then um, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. <laughs> I'd also like to share with you all what deception looks like at the beginning. I remember that Pastor Al, our author of this book, said that they will beguile you, right? Which means they will trick you. They will deceive you. And so a lot of times what organizations do is on the front end, they tell you, you know, this organization organization is founded upon Christian principles. And so they start you off with prayers and scriptures, but then they further step away from the word of God and start mixing that organization into it to the point where worship turns from God, prayers turn from God, and they turn all to the org and these Greek gods. So, for example, in the opening ceremony, I guess you could call it for this pledge um, club, they open with prayer. All right. And so then step two is for the speaker to read Ruth 1, 16 through 17. Now, um, in Ruth 16, 1, 16 through 17, it says, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught, if aught but death part thee and me. So I know that is the King James Version, but basically, you know, the scripture is saying, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Um, your people are my people. Your God is my God. Wherever you die, I will die and I will be buried there. And if basically if I break this, then the Lord is going to have to deal with me. All right. Um, if I break this before death part says the Lord is going to have to deal with me about it. They're basically saying I, I'd rather be punished by God. Right instead of breaking this vow. So this is a manipulation of scripture, all right? Because their God is not the one true God, the God of Abraham. That is not their God. Their God is Atlas. But here it really gives the Christian candidate comfort. And they say, oh man, they opened with prayer. They're sharing the scripture. But the word also says God warns us not to use his name in vain. That means don't misuse his name. Don't use his name to manipulate scripture, to have people believe in something that is not of him. And that is what we see here. But again, you have to look at this through the eyes of the Holy Spirit to understand the deception that is being played out here. Yeah. 
And um, to, to go along further in the book on page 135, um, I'm going to start with what the Basilis is making a statement here. And she asked the candidates with, um, are they willing to comply with uh, the perspective? So here's the, the asking questions and getting you to agree. The devil needs your agreement. Um, he can't just do things on the earth because we have dominion here. So he needs your agreement to basically destroy your life or to pull you to hell with him. You have to agree. So, okay. So it says if they do, she asked them individually. Um, if they comply with the perspective, they all individually kneel, raise their right hand and repeat after her. So it says the candidates are kneeling before the table while the bas basilis reads the following pledge with the candidates repeating after her. Each candidate then signs their name in the pledge book. So they get your agreement and they get you to also sign in the book. And so um, it says the candidate says desiring to become loyal and a faithful member of AKA sorority do pledge yourself to respect, obey, and defend the constitution bylaws and rituals of the organization and to abide by all the rules and regulations of the sorority. So the candidate will make their vow, then sign their name in the pledge book and the centennial or sentinel gives each a lighted pink or green candle and a small pot of ivy. While this is being done, the Basilis repeats the two lines of the ivy hymn it says, so let there not you. <laughs> I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my words here. So let there not you life like the Ivy be. And so they repeat that as they you know, as, as each candidate does their vows, kneeling and all of that. So India, what's the significance of the Ivy? Yeah, you know, I'm just still blown away by, look, I can't help it. I just got to back up to this pledge because yeah. their desire and loyalty to you or for you and this org, but not once do they, not once do they encourage you to have this level of loyalty to God. Mm. All right. They're saying you're going to be loyal and faithful. They're going to respect. They want you to put some respect on that org's name. They want you to obey, defend the Constitution, bylaws, rituals. Why are you why do you need to defend the rituals? Well, that's why half y'all are mad at us today. Because you you made this vow. That you would obey and defend the Constitution, the bylaws and the rituals. But when you take a step back, that does not even make sense. They're asking you to do things than most human beings don't even do for God. Let's think about that for a moment, okay? And then as I was studying this, the Holy Spirit, how really he speaks to me, he'll just start asking me questions. And I'll be like, man, I didn't think about that. So one of the questions that came to mind was, why the ivy? Like, what, what's the significance of this plant? So, um, based on what I've read, some believe that the ivy represents spiritual growth, transformation, and rebirth. So now we see another spiritual, religious type of connection here with this flower. All right. And the flowers are known for their ability to attach themselves to various surfaces and climb upwards, representing the upward journey towards higher self-awareness, enlightenment, and spiritual growth. What does this sound like to you all? This is still, to me, this is sounding very new age like <laughs> because we hear a lot about self awareness, enlightenment, spiritual growth, but it's never growth in Christ or, you know, abiding by or abiding in Christ. Now, in ancient times, uh, the ivy was also associated with divinity. So imagine that. And divinity in itself is defined as the state of being God, but in this case, it's a little g God. All right. And let me just stop here because I know someone's going to bring this up. I want to make it very clear that God created the ivy plant. All right. As he did with all other vegetation in the book of Genesis. You can go back and you can find that he created the grass, which was the seed. And from that seed, he populated this earth with all of the vegetation, all the trees and everything that we have here. 
But remember that the enemy will use God's beautiful and perfect creation for his evil deeds as a counterfeit. And so Christians who understand spirituality can quickly discern that choosing this flower was no coincidence. All right. I need you to think about that. Pray on it. Because again, symbolism is everything. Yeah. Yep. So um, there's another statement that was on that same page that I'm going to read. And it said, they, they pledge to live anew the kinds of lives that will show that the way to the greatest good, the supreme service to all mankind while shine their sisterhood. It, I mean, it really hits when I say the words I, but um, if you if you bought the book, which I highly encourage you to buy the book, it has, you know, what it says verbatim. But um, it says they pledge to live anew the kinds mm -hmm. of lives. So what does that sound like? That sounds like Second Corinthians 517. Um, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you're not becoming a new when you pledge AKA. You actually went backwards, back into Egypt, like Pastor Al said. Mm -hmm. But it's basically taking scripture from the Bible and twisting it. You become a new creature in Christ, not AKA. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so go a little bit further. Um, what a bacillus in the bacillus. It says, we know that your bacillus has a rich heritage from which to get her light. She and her cabinet get their light, not only from the local charter members, but also from the national program and its ideals. Okay. So if we know you know, scripture, the scripture says in Psalms 119 and 105, the word is the light. Like your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And of course, Jesus is the light because in John 18, 12, it says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So you can't get your light from others. You could only get your light from Jesus and Jesus is the word. So the word of God is the light. So what we see in AKA is Luciferianism. <laughs> um, and that's the belief system. Uh, the followers believe that the devil is the light bringer. So if you look, look up Lucifer, you'll see statues and other depictions of him holding a torch. So second Corinthians 11, 14 through 15 says, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. It is not surprising then that if his servants who masquerade as servants of righteousness. So that, I think I said it maybe the first episode where I said deception, it is, it can, it, you, you can be easily deceived because it's not going to be, the devil is not going to be blatantly obvious. The deception is very discreet. Just a little mm -hmm. thing, just a little bit, just a little bit. And if you're not really, really rooted in the word of God, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, if you're still living in habitual sin, you can be deceived 100 percent. Yeah, you'll miss it. You'll miss it. Like if the Bible says even the very elect will be deceived in the later days, the last days, which we are in the last days right now that means you can be deceived person who's living in habitual sin you can be deceived even if you're not living in habitual sin if you're not reading that bible and studying that word if you're not living a holy lifestyle or you are you half doing it half stepping don't have a prayer life you can be deceived nobody is nobody is exempt from that that's why in these last days we got to cling to the father we have to cling to jesus y'all we have to cling to him we got to study this word like our life depend on it because it does mm -hmm. 
we're talking about eternity. We are only on this earth for a small <laughs> snippet of time. Think about eternity. And that's exactly how that's exactly what I said when I got ready to renounce was. I'm only going to be here for a short snippet of time. Eternity is eternity. And while I'm alive, I'm going to follow Jesus. Now, was it hard? Yes. But I thought about my eternity. That was more important than pleasing man and being comfortable. So I kind of went off on a snippet, but <laughs> um, I want to get into the next degree. Um, oh, well, actually, the first degree, because I kind of set you up on like how the induction ceremony gets started. Now we're going into the degrees. Um, the first degree is devotion and promise. Um, the setting is on a table covered in white is a huge white candle entwined with ivy representing their founder, Ethel Lyle, which is a dead person. Hmm. Now we are teetering on the line of necromancy. Yeah. For this degree, only, only the Basilis and the pilot wear a black academic gown. The candidates wear black dresses. Each candidate should have a white candle and they enter um, with soft music. I think that I shall never know or a similar selection, which is the song. And so, um, Indy, you want to tell them about the gown? Oh, yeah. So they're setting up the whole entire, you know, uh, mood for the room. So dark room, right? Or I'm guessing low lit room. It doesn't say that. But, you know, they do light a candle. So nine times out of 10, if you're lighting a candle, the room is going to be a little, you know, darker than usual. You're entering to soft music with this song playing. So it's this ambiance, right, that they're creating. Remember before that, you've opened with prayer. You've heard a scripture from Ruth. It's really just relaxing you. It's allowing you to let your defenses down, right? And... They mention an academic gown, but I'm be real with y'all. This is not a gown or an academic gown. This is a robe that is used during a pagan ritual or it's used during a religious type of ceremony because at the core of it, we now are understanding that that is what this is. And when I did some more digging, and let me just say the Holy Spirit actually brought this to my attention when I renounced an organization. I was just sitting one evening, just, you know, pondering and praying. And I heard the question, why did you wear a robe? Why were y'all wearing robes? And so lo and behold, I'm finding out that not only was it that organization who is lighting candles in a low room, playing soft music, but now we see AKA doing the same. And so if you go to Wiccan websites and you do more research, you find out, and actually it's explained on these websites that special ritual robes is a key. So let's pause right there. Special ritual robes is a key. That's what they say. What does a key do? It unlocks a door. All right. So when we say that you're bowing down these altars or even before you get to that point, well, no, these ladies have already bowed. So you bowed at this altar. And when you do that, you are opening demonic doors. So let's keep it real when we say it's a key. A key unlocks doors, all right? So it says, then, a prompt for your subconscious to step from mundane into the spiritual. It is also considered a mark of respect to the deity or the divine. And y'all, this is what this person wrote on the site in parentheses, whomever, whatever you work with. Mm. She said, so let me read it without interrupting and giving you explanations. On the Wiccan website, it explains that special ritual robes is a key, a prompt for your subconscious to step from mundane into the spiritual. It is also considered a mark of respect to the deity or the divine, whomever or whatever you work with. The fact you have thought about what you are wearing for a ritual 
It is a way of honoring them. Them. What is them? Them. Who is them? So now not only is it one, but it's multiple. multiple. So and when you know it's only one God, one God. Yeah. One God. And you know what? I don't have to wear anything. And that's another thing when it comes to witchcraft. You always have to do something. You always have to have a special protocol. You have rules and guidelines to follow. It has to be done the same every single time. The words have to be recited to a point based on what's in the book. You have to wear certain types of clothing. You always have to light candles. You know what I love about having a relationship with Jesus Christ? You know what I love about having my he heavenly father, the one true living God? I don't have to light a candle to worship him. I don't have to wear special clothing to worship him. I can sing to him one day. I can pray to him. I can even pray quietly in the spirit, even if I'm around people. I don't have to put on a show for God. He loves me and accepts any form of praise that I give him. But anytime you have to follow a specific protocol and you're changing the lighting, the settings, and it's a specific song, this is witchcraft. This is pagan rituals because these demons require you to worship to them a certain type of way. So I need you to think about that. That is not what God requires. I was actually just watching a TikTok earlier today and it's right on time. And this ex-witch said that one thing she loves about being a Christian now is that she doesn't have to do anything but believe in Jesus Christ <laughs> as her <laughs> Lord and Savior. But when she was a witch, she was always giving and doing and doing and doing something. And then she got nothing out of it. She got torment and a host mm -hmm. of other issues. So um, another key point is this self-proclaimed witch also went on to state that robes were worn when she was initiated. Get that. So before she could even join their covenant, her the, the folks, right, the leaders of these groups wore robes to initiate her. What's happening here? Oh, they're wearing black academic gowns. Mm. Maybe that is a robe, all right? And it's used in witchcraft and paganistic rituals. Um. Another thing that we see here on page 139, it goes on to say, in the years to come, AKA sorority will continue to be a channel through which individuals may find together what they cannot find separately or independently, security. I mean, so, my security comes from the Lord. What about you, Chris? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So you're basically, with this, they're basically just Xing out Jesus right now at this point. Mm -hmm. Because we should find our security in God and his word and Jesus Christ and the word of God. <laughs> like, not AKA, we shouldn't find security in anything other than the Lord. And I know there's countless scriptures about that as well. So I want to go ahead and move on. Um, we're still on page 139 and it says, oh, ooh, okay. They asked the question, do you wish to unite with this group of women? And it says a few other things. And the pilot to the probate says, repeat after me, the bacillus says this, and the pilot, which is leading the candidates now, because we now we've inserted the pilot who is basically leading the candidates into the, the ritual of the, this degree. So the pilot probates to probates says, repeat after me. And they say they do. The pilot will say they do. And then they will repeat and say they do. Um, then the basilis says, let us pray. And then. She then they says she was said she says repeat after me and they say open your eyes of God that they may behold the wondrous works of this organization. So not the wondrous works of Jesus like. <laughs> and if you skip down. To the next line, it reads this one, it says take from them any selfishness and lack of purpose 
which could keep them from following the ideas of the organization. So that's again, that's putting the organization first as like, they're, it's putting the organization where Jesus should be. Um, and it goes on to say, awaken within them holy desires, inspire them with a new enthusiasm of the reverend founders, I'm excuse me, as the revered founders and grant them wisdom and strength that they may render service to all mankind. Then they say, in Jesus name, amen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so the whole focus of this prayer was AKA, not Jesus. And then it says, revered founders who are dead, by the way, um, and we talked about in the first video, what revered means. That is a synonym for worship. So you're saying revered founders who are dead. So that's worship of founders. And you're doing it in Jesus name. And that's again saying the names, the Lord's name in vain. So then they go on. And let's back that up. It talks about wisdom. They ask the dead founders to grant them wisdom, not the Lord. There, there's a scripture in the Bible, and I can't remember exact scripture. Maybe I'll find I'll. I'll find it and I'll tag it, but it says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So if you need wisdom, you start with that. Dead founders cannot grant you wisdom and strength. You get your strength and your wisdom from the Lord. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. So then it asks them again if they're willing to accept and they say they do. So that's another time that they're asking them to accept, you know, whatever they're they're asking of. They say they do. That's the marriage. The Basilis to probate says. Then probate say they sincerely dedicate their time and talent to the growth and development of the sorority. They promise in deed and truth. Another part of the ritual takes place with candles of dead founders. So the basilis lights a candle with a single white candle on the table, the altar, representing Ethel, Lyle. From her candle, she lights the pilot's candle. So they're, they're taking candles and lighting each other's candles at this point. Who lights, and the pilot takes their candle and lights the first candidate's candle and it and is passed on to all candidates. All of the candidates' candles are lit. Then the basilis says, pass on the torch, Pass on this flame. Remember from whence the glory came. They, that glory came, and this was repeated every single time they light each other's candle. And as they're lighting each other's candle, the pilot to the candidate says, "Repeat after me." They say, "They take the torch from you. They will be true. They will be free and clean of heart, and strong to beat the glory to its goal." To your founders. We bow, then they bow their heads. And then it says, their purpose seal, I will, excuse me, they will for honor of thy name, pass on the torch, pass on the flame. In honor of who? So they started about, they started off with revered founders who are dead. So now you're doing a worship ceremony to dead founders, which is necromancy. So they finish that. Y'all, this is witchcraft, by the way. They finish that. That's the first degree. <laughs> and then the pilot leads. And I'm sorry that I'm laughing, guys. I just got to laugh sometimes. I laugh when I don't want to cry. But like, the pilot ends up lead, leading the candidates out of the room while singing softly. That's just another form of worship. 
like I really I really hope you guys are understanding what we're saying here um yeah uh, look I know y'all see my facial expressions uh I mean again once the veil has been lifted you see this stuff for what it is so as Chris has stated we're seeing a pattern of repeated witchcraft, repeated witchcraft behaviors. Um, at this point, we know that Exodus 23 through six says, you shall have no other gods before me. And the word goes on to say, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. And here they have bowed to them multiple times, blatantly, right? It's very clear. And they have also now made promises that they would serve them. Are we clear on that? Okay. And, you know, I once had a member of um, this org tell me, oh, no, I didn't bow at an altar. Well, every member did because it's right here in the ritual book. And I will say that, you know, for any member, even, you know, I've, I've had ladies of other orgs, even the or org that I was in say I did not bow. And I was like, you know what, when you're there in front of all those folks, you're bowing <laughs> because, you know, that's the only way for you to get to the next level. And um, I'm also shaking my head in disbelief because this is an organization that prides itself on, uh, I would say this, even though it's not outlined right here in these, uh, in the text, we know that, you know, this organization holds itself to a higher standard. They're college educated women, uh, you know, they are well-rounded they probably have um, not, you know, I'm not even gonna say probably I'll say this. The women that I know who are in this organization are some amazing women. They uphold themselves to high standards. They have morals. They have values. They're loving moms, wives, aunties, sisters, grandmas, like you name it, right? Good women. All right. So keep in mind when I'm saying this, I'm talking about the organization, but this organization flat out plagiarized this passage. So they stole this passage from a man named Alan Eastman Cross. Um, and it's interesting because he is the author of the hymn called Pass on the Torch. So what this organization did is they took that entire passage and they removed Lord Christ and oh Lord of life. And then they adapted it to what they wanted it to say. Now, this hymn was written in 1929. So based on the timing, of course, clearly they integrated this into the rituals after the org was founded and after this hymn to our Lord and Savior was written. All right. So they knew what the original hymn said. They removed Jesus Christ's name from it. And I want to read to you what this hymn actually says. It says, Lord Christ, we take the torch from thee. We must be true. We must be free and clean of heart and strong of soul to bear the glory to its goal. O Lord of life, to thee, we kneel, maker of men, our purpose seal. We will honor of thy name, pass on the torch, pass on the flame. So you wow. tell me why an organization that is based on Christian principles, Christ is in the word Christian. That means you are a follower of Christ, right? So if you're going to publicize and advertise that you're based on these principles, but when it comes down to the nitty gritty, you remove Christ out of it, then what are you? Because this is not adding up. So if you are a true believer of Christ, I need you to question why, one, were they dishonest and they stole from this man? They never gave him credit. In this ritual book, it does not say it is a um, paraphrase from the hymn, Pass the Torch, Pass on the Torch by Alan Eastman Cross. His name is nowhere listed here. You just have to do your research. All right. <laughs> um, but we're going to move on to the next degree, which is obedience. So uh, if you go to page 141, the Basilis um, has the candidates uh, 
to have the candidates made satisfactory answers to questions and express their desire to unite with them. So again, they're asking them again, you know, do you want to unite with them? And they're agreeing to it. Um, once they admit that they have and they're ready to unite, um, you go further down and it says the basilis to the candidate. Are you willing um, to be submissive in every way to sub subjugate your yourself to the highest authority? What's the highest authority here? Like, <laughs> so now they ask you to unite with them. And then they're asking you, are you going to be submissive? So in every which way they're asking you, you know, to agree. Another level, it's like another level, they're just laying it on. Mm -hmm. um, so it says, um, well, basically, let's touch on the highest authority. So we know the most high God is the highest authority. He's not mentioned there in that ritual. So it gets even more idolatrous as the question, um, as the ladies answer the question to that saying, they say, uh, I and their name. So they'll say I and their name. And they'll say that they do solemnly promise to love and to revere the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. So this is telling us right there, right here, what they are saying their highest authority is. It's not God. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's AKA. That is their highest authority. So they are agreeing to becoming one, uniting, and they are agreeing to be submissive to the highest authority. And now we know that their highest authority is Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So moving further along, the Basilis asks what proof they have. And the pilot says, while having the candidate repeat after them and say, they show by they, they show their submission by kneeling. Then each candidate kneels for a few minutes in silence. Then after each candidate kneels in silence, the basilis then says candidates arise and the pilot leads the candidates in a line in a winding way. So while doing the basilis repeats this phrase seven times, we know seven means completion. In seven days, God made the heavens and the earth. He made that in six days and on the seventh day he rested. You can see that in Genesis one. So they say while they're winding, they say, Life is a winding maze, an intricate labyrinth through which they must wander all their days. I'm taking out I, guys. Just I just want you all to remember that I'm taking out the word I. So. And do you want to tell them about the labyrinth? <laughs> yes. So let's think about this um, again. All witchcraft behavior. You, you know, and. Isn't it like the devil to use something of God and then flip it and twist it? And now you are repeating something multiple times, like the audacity, right? For the devil to say, oh, well, how about this? How about you repeat this seven times? Because on his end, he's just saying, yeah, once, once you say this, you're locked and sealed in. All right. And. I want to I want us to think about what a maze and a labyrinth really is. And I struggle with saying labyrinth. Let me just say so bear with me. It's not my favorite word because maze and labyrinth are used interchangeably, but they are different. Now, a maze is a network of pathways that usually have multiple branching routes, dead ends and intersections. And get this, the main goal of a maze is to confuse you while navigating through it from start to finish. Let me say that again, just in case you did not hear me. The main goal of a maze is to confuse you while navigating through it from start to finish. Now, knowing who God is, I don't know, y'all, my eyes have been watering, just all type of stuff. Knowing who God is, knowing that he is not the author of confusion, does this sound like something you would want repeated over your life several times? No, you would not want someone to curse you with confusion 
going down this winding path for the rest of your life. Now, a labyrinth consists of a single non-branched pathway. So think about that. Now you're just on one path that leads you to the entrance, um, leads you from the entrance to the center of something. And it doesn't include all these intersections and dead ends like the maze. And the purpose of it is not to confuse you, but it's to serve as, and I'm going to put it in the quotation marks, a tool for contemplation, meditation, or ceremonial purposes. And they aim to guide you along a winding pathway. So it's a mixture of things because they are cursing you with confusion but then they want you to meditate and contemplate on all of the values of the sorority and everything they want you to do. But this is a spell, y'all. Like if you think about the word of God, there's not one place where you'll see the Lord um, wishing for you to be confused. Now, his word does say in a few passages, like, you know, if you continue to disobey him, Okay, fine. He'll allow you to be confused and <laughs> you have to eventually come back to him and figure it out. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing that, but this is a spell. This is a curse over your life. Um, this type of stuff is what leads to members needing deliverance. And I'm saying that to you because I had to go through deliverance after renouncing the organization that I was in and Crest did as well. No one should ever be speaking this type of confusion over your life. And no one certainly should not be repeating it over and over several times. All right. So um, then it says candidates are then taken into the, I guess, the ante room, which is basically a waiting room um, after the seventh intonation. All right. So after the seventh time, they go back into a waiting room. Then the pilot asks the candidates if they are willing to enter into the mysteries of the organization. Now, if you watched episode two, Pastor Al mentioned that in the Alpha Phi Alpha ritual book, it also talks about them entering into the mysteries of that organization. So now we see it here again. And I want you all to know that the mysteries they are referring to is a religion. This is actually stuff you can look up. The mystery religion um, were secret, like various secret cults. So think about that. We got the mystery religions. They were various secret cults, which means there was multiple uh, kinds, different kinds. And these were cults of the Greco-Roman and Greek world. They started as tribal ceremonies. So that means if you were a part of a tribe, you were automatically in. So that means almost every member of the clan or the village was initiated. But over time, things changed and initiation became a personal decision. I also want to mention that in order to be initiated, they had to go through things that caused mental distress. A lot of times they caused them to break a law. Like they were doing some wild stuff even back then. I'm talking about like, I forgot the time frame. It was like, now, you know, I'm not even gonna make it up, but it was a long time ago. I'm talking about ancient times. They had them doing this stuff and not much has changed in Greek letter organizations. Now, the word mystery is derived from the Greek verb myin, which means to close, referring to the lips and the eyes. So there's two ways we can look at this. For one, to close the lips and the eyes is referring to you keep it a secret, Right. But I also feel as though within truly my heart, this means you're closing your eyes and your lips to anything concerning the Lord. It's spiritual blindness that you're coming into agreement with. And mysteries have always been secret cults requiring initiation and for the initiates to be uh, then introduced to a leader who would take them underneath their wings and then help them move along the process. So I want to make that very clear because I know someone's going to say, oh, well, maybe they weren't always this. No, this was the root. OK, this was the foundation. The mysteries religions were just that secret cults requiring initiation and abuse and all these different types of processes for them to be accepted. And interesting enough, the leader that 
initiates were introduced to the leader of the cult. They were called the leader of holy things, and they were also called the torch bearer. So now we see another theme. How dare they say the leader of holy things? There is nothing holy about this. This is completely detestable to God. It's the complete opposite, but we know the devil is a liar. Another interesting point that I want to bring up is that mystery societies also had dances, ceremonies, and they had common meals together. And this was all created to strengthen their bond of each cult. What do you do in your organization to strengthen the bonds during the initiation process? You have all these ceremonies and I'm sorry, but AK, y'all got a lot of them, a whole lot of them. There are dances uh, you learn in order to prepare for the coming out, right? The probate show. And then oftentimes food is involved because that is a way that you bond with one another. So to me, the math is math and it's lining up. If the mystery religions is a cult, then guess what? You are in a cult too, or in a cult too. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but these are the facts. Um, Chris, I'll let you have it. And if you want to add anything else and move on. So I want to, um, I know you talked about deliverance. Um, I want to back that up and um, talk about that before I go on to the next degree. Mm-hmm. Y'all, the amount of spiritual warfare that I dealt with Um, once I found out, you know, it was being in a sorority was not of God. I didn't realize that I was already in spiritual warfare, experiencing the effects of that from the very first person that really planted a seed, which was a whole year before I had, um, actually renounced. When I look back I don't know, maybe a few months ago, I was just like, just thinking about, you know, what I've been through the past few years. When I look back, I thought my spiritual warfare started in 2023, but it was really, it really started from 2022. I mean, cause the person that, that sowed the seed was at the end of 2021. And I had started to experience a lot of spiritual warfare that I just thought was just, you know, like things just happen, right? And I did not realize it until, you know, the start of 2023 when I was like, oh, my goodness, I need deliverance, you know, Um, from accidents to um, things happening financially. And I mean, back to back accidents um, from tormenting dreams, not being able to sleep, being suffocated and sat on in my sleep, you know, they people call it. Um, what do they call it? What's the word for it? They say hag or they say the devil riding your back. No, it's a, it's a medical term that they say. Oh, sleep paralysis. Uh, sleep paralysis, which, you know, I found out later that it's really a demon mm-hmm. attacking you. And so, um, I gained weight. I was losing weight, gaining weight, um, because I couldn't rest and a person that can't sleep, you know, they're, they're not healthy basically. Um, and so, you know, I needed help for that. And I, I, I didn't, it was like, I was just learning about all these things and I was experiencing this spiritual warfare and I didn't know what to do. And so, um, you know, I found the flawed and free ministry and I went through the flawed and free ministry here in DFW, um, for deliverance, but y'all, this was a process and deliverance is ongoing like pastor al said and you know in the second video like it's it's an ongoing process so anybody i don't know who this was for and why i needed to bring this up so if anybody is interested in joining a greek sorority and fraternity and you have stumbled upon this video and you don't quite believe what we're saying or you just think you know it's just our personal convictions i'm telling you it is not worth it it is not worth you joining that sorority or fraternity and then later finding out that you shouldn't have joined it and then you going through all this spiritual warfare this is part of the reason why i was crying earlier because if i could go back in time back in 2013 i would have never joined if i would have known what i knew now 
if somebody was literally out here screaming it from the rooftops, which I'm pretty sure people were, but I didn't see it at all. It wasn't in my sphere of influence. So I am trying to basically tell you whoever's going to watch this video, who I'm clearly talking to, it is not worth it. I'm telling you now, it is not worth it. And I am thankful. I am blessed because God loved me enough to send people to plant seeds and water it that he ultimately gave the increase for. And he saved me <laughs> from going to an eternity, from dying in this organization, dying in that organization and going to hell. It is that deep. It is not a personal conviction. It is a every Christian conviction. If you claim that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but you are in these organizations, you will not go to heaven if you die in it. The scripture says that. It says that four times in the New Testament. We are telling you how these organizations are idolatry. There are false gods tied to each org, which is ultimately the devil. If you die, and this was a part of my, the second one, I was going to save it to the end of this video, but I just feel the Holy Spirit telling me to say this right now. If you die in this organization, you will go to hell. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what that means in those scriptures. It doesn't matter all of your good works. You can literally live a consecrated life all your life. Not live in habitual sins. Don't do habitual sins. Repent all of that. But if you die in that or with that covenant intact. You will not go to heaven. That's what those scriptures are telling you. And this is why God has had us come out. We have already renounced and he's had us denounce. That's why a lot of people who renounce God ultimately wants them to denounce, to spread the word, because we all have a sphere of influence. We all have somebody we know that will trust what we say. And this is why he wanted us to expose it. This is why we can't stay silent. Now, I'm not I don't know if God is calling everybody to denounce because denounce means publicly declare. But for sure. You have to renounce if you want to go to heaven. And the question that he had me ask people in that dream was, he said, excuse me, I said what he told me to say in the dream, is any org worth you going to hell for eternity? Eternity means forever. I don't know if you guys have listened to any of the hell testimonies on YouTube of people who had near death experiences or have died and the Lord allowed them to see what hell looks like and gave them another chance and allowed them to come back and tell everybody to testify because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. They have described what hell looks like. They have described the compartments of, of people in hell and who's there. And they said people who profess themselves as Christians are there. I really just I'm, I'm just really harping on this because I really need you guys to understand it is this serious. It is that serious. So. Yeah. Um, I just want to add to that because I've also had. Uh, I've also experienced spiritual attack. Um, I had spiritual warfare and it was so heavy. It was so incredibly heavy. Um, gosh, just thinking about it. Um, has me overwhelmed because I'm almost like I can't believe that I experienced that. And that's how you know that God is real, but you also know the devil is real. And it allows you to see like, yes, there's heaven and there's hell. And those attacks that I experienced were enough for me to know that I was doing the right thing and that I wanted to stay on the right side. Because here's the thing about it, and I'm not saying this to scare you all, because remember, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us power of love and of sound mind. But when I renounced that organization, immediately, within like a few days, I experienced sleep paralysis. And sleep paralysis was something I had not experienced for years and years. The last time I had experienced it, I was um, deep in sin somewhere I should not have been. 
And um, it was in the middle of the night. This um, guy I was dating at the time. We get it all the time, y'all. Almost every night he would get sleep paralysis. And I did not know that's what it was. And then one night it scared me so bad. I grabbed him to shake him like, are you okay? And I felt something literally muffle my mouth just like that when I tried to cry out for the Lord. I felt like I could not breathe. That spirit smothered me. And then I had to cry out for Jesus in my head and it went away. So even in that sin, <laughs> even that moment, I'm with somebody I should not have been with. That was, you know, a boyfriend. I should not have been over his house that time of the night or anything. Spend the night, period. Here I am calling out for Jesus and he still saved me. And that thing fled. So that was a long time ago. I'm talking about over a decade ago. Okay. And here I am now, married, a mother, praying, fasting. And when I broke that covenant, I was holding one of my children, y'all. I was holding my baby. And I had dozed off to sleep. And I felt this dark force come over me. And then all of a sudden, I could see myself in the spirit. I've never seen this before. It was like my, my forearms were held up. It's like my body, somebody was holding me up like a dark force by my forearms. And I was just limp, but I could see it and I could feel it. And when I tried to call for Jesus, it tried to smother me again. And I could not move even though I was holding my child. And so when I said into my head, it vanished. All right. And so I dealt with that multiple times. It happened again when I was holding another one of my ch children. I got two. So now I'm really ticked off because I'm like, how are you going to come for me when I'm holding my babies? But guess what? That's what the devil does when you're in these covenants. He's going to come after you and he's going to come after your children one way or another, straight up. And I refused to have the enemy come after my children. I'll tell you this one last story. I got my young, well, my oldest, a beginner's Bible. So I started to read it to her. And after like three or four nights, I had a terrifying dream that she was on one side and a demon was on the other side. And there was a line between them. And I knew the line was there, but I couldn't see it, if that makes sense. Like I knew it was a partition. And this demon wanted to eat her. Like he wanted to devour her. I could tell the way he was breathing and panting over her. And she was just kind of standing there as an innocent little child. And um, I woke up and started rebuking and binding and going into like spiritual warfare prayers. And this scared me so bad. I went to a deliverance church because at that point I knew like I need deliverance right now. But what the pastor told me is that the Lord was showing me that my baby was protected. Regardless of what that demon wanted to do, my baby was covered. And that motivated me even more to fight and get rid of all the spiritual bondage that I was in. Because remember, it, it, that sin and iniquity will follow down to the third and fourth generation. And I've got so much more that I'll share. And I think eventually, Crest and I, we're just going to have to do a video about spiritual warfare. We talk about that experience. Um, but it's real. Yeah. Um, so just to keep continue on in the video. We're, we're now in uh, degree three, which is faith and trust. So at the beginning of degree three, the pilot knocks on the door that they are getting ready to enter. And um, there's a line stated in this section that, uh, that should make you think. It says, the bonds of sisterhood are strong that faith and trust are blind with no reservations. So they want their members to have blind trust and unwavering confidence or faith. So that's that's rooted in mind control. And that actually comes from uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry. And if you think about the degrees, Freemasonry has degrees. And so now we can see that AKA has gotten their degrees from Freemasonry. So to read a, um, I read it, uh, I'm sorry, an excerpt of, this, of a ritual that the members had to repeat. And it was something like, with no hesitation or reservation, over and over. 
So that's that's contrary to what scripture says, guys. Psalms 118, 18 says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. So if you are doing it with no hesitation or reservation over and over again, if you're saying the bonds, which is binding of sisterhood are strong, that faith and trust are blind with no reservations, you're not going to think about it. You're not going to have any reservations. You're, you're not going to speak up. Um, that's what the ritual says. And I want to clarify that with no hesitation or reservations came from Freemasonry, but the bonds of sisterhood came from AKA. So we can, we can see here with that scripture in 118.8 is saying that you put your trust in the Lord, take refuge in him and not in man. But you can't do that if you're doing what the ritual is saying. If you're blindly, blindly following this organization with no reservations which we can see came from Freemasonry. Okay, so then they ask you to agree again. So they needed agreement again. We're just adding layers on at this point. They say they do. Okay, um, moving along. Then they ask you to further go into bondage of the next degree, which is fidelity and love. And they ask you, do you want to continue? Candidates say yes. So now there's another table, aka an altar, with white candles, ivy, and or roses. They're still in a semicircle here. And uh, the the basilis says, you have passed a degree of obedience and faith. You have shown willingness to accept the ideals and mandates of their organization. You have expressed your faith in the ideals and aims of the org. Now, are you willing to pledge your allegiance to AKA that you will remain steadfast in your attachment to this sorority and promise us, excuse me, and promise them your constant effort in its behalf? The candidates say they will. Now, the candidates kneel again and take the oath that reads they do solemnly promise to keep secret the manner of initiation pledge in a and obligations of the AKA sorority. They solemnly promise always to live up to the ideals of the organization, to stand by a AKA in every undertaking, to render assistance to any soror at all times and to refrain from any expression of ill will. They shall keep in their hearts these words, set a guard over your mouth, keep watch over the door of your lips. They do solemnly promise to love and revere, which is worship, the AKA sorority, and to do all in the, their power to perpetuate the organization. Then each candidate rises and, their, and her candle is lighted. A wreath of ivy is placed on her head and the badge is placed upon or over her heart. Then they sign their name in the book. And then the basilis says, your vows have been said and your pledge made, which is marriage. By so doing, you have accepted a wonderful challenge that requires your continuous interest, devoted efforts in a lifetime of service. Whew. Then it says you are entering the last phase of this sacred hour. So we know this is a, this is a ceremony. It's saying sacred. Um, so this is when you pledge your life to the organization and not Jesus. And then you even go a step further and you write your name in the book. So page 145 says they say a prayer and start it with eternal spirit. So what is the eternal spirit? I'm not going to say the whole prayer. You guys can, if you buy the book, you can go see it. Um, but they started the prayer with eternal spirit and they pray to the eternal spirit. So what is that? <sighs> they asked it for understanding of spiritual things and walk closer with it. They ended it with a man. So if they're praying to an eternal spirit, that's not the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
no father in heaven, no God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, no, no Jesus Christ, but the eternal spirit. Guys, we cannot serve two masters. We can't. The Bible says it. You will either hate one or and love the other. You can't have both. So. India, you have anything to add? Yeah, so you cannot serve two masters. I just wanted to say that again. And this is what it looks like, everyone, when you are serving two masters. I know you don't mean it. I know this is not what you thought that it is, but this is the truth, all right? And I find this funny because in the Delta Sigma Theta ritual book, we see a similar name. They actually call it the eternal spirit of truth. So it's a little variation, but it's the same. So we've seen in Alpha Phi Alpha, now, AKA, and what you'll learn later on when we cover Delta is that we're seeing a pattern of worship and repeated request for guidance from some type of either eternal spirit or with Alpha, it was the spirit of fraternity. Either way it goes, um, one thing I've learned, and I actually um, got this quote from Apostle Tina, who runs the Fla uh, Flawed and Free Ministry, is that it's either the Holy Spirit or demonic spirit. There's no in between. Okay? There's no gray area. Either it came from God or it came from Satan. And you cannot sit up here and in one moment ask God, the one true God, all right, for guidance, for all other things going on in your life. But then go over here and pray to this demonic eternal spirit, asking for it to guide you and help you walk closer in all of your ways for the work of the sorority and for your community. Do you see how those two can't exist? Again, light cannot walk with darkness, okay? And I need you to, just to sit and truly think about that, all right? Because Paul, oh my goodness, I wish I had the scripture in front of me. Um, it is in Corinthians, but Paul talks about how these Greek gods are demons and that you cannot, you know, sit at the table with them and then serve the Lord as well. Yeah, I think that's, First Corinthians eight or ten. So, um, yeah, if we move along to page one forty seven of the book, they start the initiation hymn with the word. They say, "They say, hail Alpha, dear. They greet thee. Hail means one uh, definite. It means publicly praise, approve, or greet." Um, since we see at the end of this stance, they're definitely they're definitely praising, aka. So the end of the hymn says, and I'm not, I'm not gonna read the whole hymn. Um, the end of the hymn says, they'll always reverence, aka forever and a day. And they say that three times. So going back. Again, to the first episode, when we define what worship is and gave the synonyms of worship, reverence, you can see throughout this whole ritual that, I mean, we've actually said this several times during this, this episode, how they want you to revere and reverence, AKA. So um, if I move on to their pledge, their pledge says, to the O AKA, which I believe it says, O oh, Alpha, Kappa Alpha, they pledge their hearts, their, their minds, their strength to foster their teachings, obey thy laws, and make thee supreme in service to all mankind. O oh, Alpha, Kappa Alpha, they greet thee. So again, the Bible, the Bible, y'all, the Bible says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, all the soul, and all their mind. And AK is telling you to, telling them to do something different. So, India, you got anything to add to that? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, so anytime you use the words thou, thine, thee, 
thy the intent of these program i mean not programs the intent of these pronouns are to show respect to god all right and these are actually considered reverent forms of speech notice i said reverent because we reverence goes to god all right our god and it's a form of respect it's like a formality when you're addressing God in prayer, when you're speaking about him. Um, so again, we're seeing a clear pattern of idolatry here because all the things that are set apart for God are now being used to glorify the organization, the founders, their eternal spirit, um, and everything wrapped up in this org. And so guess what? Satan pulled Jesus to the side on day 40 of his fast. And what did he say to him? He said, you know, I'm paraphrasing. He gave, he'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. If you just bow down and you worship him. Do you not see Satan doing the same thing throughout these organizations? We've seen in this book that these ladies have bowed multiple times. They have submitted to the highest authority. They revere the organization, and they're also praying to an eternal spirit, which, by the way, that means it lasts forever and ever. Wouldn't you agree that if you don't break this covenant, the things you've said and done will last forever and ever? So when you stand before God, who do you think you should spend eternity with? If you were God, would you find it acceptable for someone to cheat on you repeatedly for years and years, even though his servants had come to lovingly share a warning. His servants came to you. They had scripture to back it up. They had real experience. They had guidance by the Holy Spirit. They prayed with you. They prayed for you. And yet you refuse. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Because you didn't get to know him well enough to understand what he loves and what he hates and what idolatry means to him and why it is detestable, why it is an abomination to him. That's why he would say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's why you can't serve two masters because you can't go up to the Lord expecting to enter into heaven, being in covenant with Satan. Like it doesn't even make any sense. So yeah, yeah. that's what I had to share. Um, to finish off this video, I want to read this scripture. Um, the Holy Spirit brought this to my mind to say, um, Hosea 4, 6, and I, I often say this, I say this often, actually. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou has rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. That thou shall be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. I need y'all to understand how deep that is. You're, the Lord is saying his people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, destroyed. Because thou has rejected knowledge. So that's not just saying that you're just ignorant and don't just know. They're also saying that you rejected it. So this is the knowledge that we're giving you from the Bible, from the word of God. This is not our opinions. This came from scripture and you are rejecting it. And the Lord is saying here, because you rejected knowledge, that he will reject you. And it also saying this, since you've forgotten the law of God, what is the law? The law is this Bible right here. This is the rule book, as uh, Pastor Kevin Ewan would say. This is the rule book. This is where you get your knowledge from. This is where you get wisdom from and understanding from. This is why you have to study it, not just read it. You have to study it to understand. So when you reject what we're saying to you, we're not trying to force things on you. God is God is not a forceful God. He will present things to you and it's up to you to decide if you're going to choose Jesus or your gods, little, little G gods, your idols. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with you. As we said in Exodus 20, three through five, it goes down to the third and the fourth generation. It says here in Hosea 4, 6, 
I will also forget thy children. So your decisions don't just affect you. It affect your entire lineage down to the third and fourth generation. So somebody decides that I am going to be the repair of the breach, according to Isaiah 58. Which you can see that at the end of that scripture, at the end of that, that chapter. The repair of the breach, which is me, which is India. We wised up, the Lord got, you know, we the Lord got through to us. We we decided to choose Jesus. And that's when we went through deliverance, praying, fasting, studying the word, spending more time in prayer. That is a repair of the breach. Someone who stopped the cycle in their family. <sighs> Y'all, these videos are very hard for me to do. Um, because it's, I already know it's going to piss people off. Um, but it's something that God has placed it upon us to do because he has delivered us out of bondage. We went back. I think, uh, pastor Al might've said that in the second video, we went back to Egypt when we joined these uh, sororities and fraternities. Um, it talks about that, you know, the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt because of you know, the food that they had in Egypt, they had better food. And in the wilderness, they're eating, you know, manna and, and quail. And they're sick of that. And they're tired of going and they're tired of being in the wilderness and they're complaining and they want to go back to Egypt, which is bondage. They were in bondage, y'all. And so when we when you join these organizations, you're going to you're going in bondage. And the, the, the Lord delivered us out of that, y'all. So we're just being obedient. We're exposing darkness evil according to i believe it's ephesians 5 11. He, it is a command for us to expose darkness and that's why we're speaking out we're crying loud and sparing not so we're not trying to condemn you we're not trying to you know talk bad about you make you feel down tear you down we're not trying to do any of that we are coming to you guys with love showing you what the Bible is saying and, and comparing it to your ritual book. Not for, we're not doing it for clickbait. We're not doing it for, what's the word they've used? Clout. Clout. That makes we're not no doing sense. It for clout. We, I mean, okay, y'all, that is insane. The amount of hate that we get for, for exposing this stuff, who wants that? The amount of spiritual warfare that we go through when we expose this stuff, who wants that? That is not clout chasing. Do you know the amount of fasting and praying that we have to do when we do stuff like this? Because we do experience spiritual warfare when we come out and speak. Mm -hmm. It never fails. Every single video, <laughs> like the yeah. enemy is fighting Yeah. every single time. I'll tell you this, Chris. The last time, well, I pray about this a lot. I pray for all of you. If you're watching this video, I include you in my prayers. I truly do. And during the recent fast that I completed, the day that we were praying for folks who are still in these organizations, I'm sorry, that night, you know, that day, that night, we were praying against it. We were praying for people to come out, be free from deception. I was actually attacked in my dreams by a demon. But it was the first time in my dream that I fought back and I won. And I mm -hmm. told the demon, I said, I bind you, demon, in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, demon, in the name of Jesus. And he had no choice but to flee. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is 100% true. That's why you can't sit up here and say, oh, it doesn't mean anything. There's no spiritual components. No, we fight the enemy in order to get out the word of God, but we know God is so much stronger than any devil, witch, warlock, or hater for that matter, or anyone, right, who is demonically oppressed as a result of their attachments to whatever sin. Yeah. But it's real. Yeah. And um, the Holy Spirit just brought this to me as well. Um, if you're listening to this and you're in this in an organization and you are afraid um, of the repercussions of renouncing, um, maybe you have people in your family that are Greek. Um, maybe you're married or in a relationship with someone that is Greek, um, or maybe you're just scared of, you know, just what may, what people may say. Um, well, first and foremost, we should fear God because God 
is the one that can kill the soul and the body. Um, man can only kill the body. So um, that was one of my hangups when I got ready to renounce um, was, you know, am I going to lose my family and am I, am I going to lose my friends? Um, you might. I'm just going to be real with you, real with you. You might you might lose family. Family might stop talking to you. Friends might stop talking to you. But the beautiful thing about God is he will send you new friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. Me and India. God sent me India. He will send you new friends. There, there's a community of people who have renounced, and we all, you know, commune in the the Facebook groups um, as well. And so, if you are, in, you know, if you're in a Greek organization and you know you need some support, you can reach out to me. Um, probably Instagram. <laughs> it's purposely Chris, and um, I can kind of help you out with that as well. Um, and then also about the spiritual warfare thing. Um, that was another thing that the Holy Spirit wanted me to touch on. You will experience that, but don't be afraid. You have Jesus. God will protect you. When you tell the Lord that you're ready to renounce and ask him for your his protection to help you and guide you um, and deliver you um, through, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. So you can be delivered by reading this, reading the rule book, the word of God coming into revelation. You can be delivered through that and then deliverance, um, because there's also a scripture in Matthew 17, 21 that says, how be it this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting. I highly, highly recommend that you go out and start reaching out to a deliverance, a trusted deliverance ministry. Trusted is a, is a huge keyword here. A trusted deliverance ministry to help you walk you through deliverance because a lot of times, well, I, I think actually in the second video we asked past, I asked Pastor Al, like, do you think it's rec- that it that anybody that renounces these organizations should go through deliverance? And he said, yes. And from the spiritual warfare that I went through, it was needed. It was needed. So highly recommend you find a trusted deliverance ministry, get plugged in, start your prayer and fasting, renouncing, um, and then go through deliverance, uh, assisted deliverance. You can also, there's also self-deliverance prayers online as well that you can go through as well from a trusted deliverance ministry because there are a lot of, there, there's some fakes out here. So um, that's why I said trust it. So um, and you can do your research on YouTube. You can do your, your research on Google um, deliverance ministries in your area. Um, and, you know, like you do reviews for things that you buy and, and you do that, that deep search on that. You need to do that for the deliverance ministry as well. So that's it for me. And do you have anything else before I close this out? Oh, my goodness. I think we've done enough. We've cried and told all these side stories. (laughs) It's nothing but a work of the Holy Spirit, truly. Like, listen, we had a plan, but when the Holy Spirit moves, we got to move with him. So I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, This was supposed to be shorter. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If you stuck it out to the end, I truly appreciate you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with someone you know that's in a Greek organization or interested in the Greek organization. And yeah, thank you guys for watching us. Bye. Bye.